If I don't want somebody to go into this room, I'm going to say, you can't go into this room. Versus, you can't go into this room? So my tone, my pitch, I speak with conviction. So what do you sound like when you deliver your information? What words do you use? That's the thing. What do they hear? What do they hear when they hear you? Like I know a lot of people who can't watch themselves on camera, can't hear themselves like, oh my God, is that what I sound like? Then fix it. Everything that you say really does apply to just the real world. Like obviously you live in this or you have lived in this like unique situation, but with walking into a room, um, you know, a lot of people fear going into social, you know, rooms socially. It's like they, they don't feel confident enough. And so having a certain body presence, um, things like that, I just find fascinating. Talk to me about like appearance and things like that on how um, looks really do matter. I know the people say, oh, it's on the inside that counts, you know, not what's on the outside. Yeah, no. Think of it this way. If nobody knows you, all they have to judge you by is what they see. Mm -hmm. And some research shows that within the first five seconds, people make their impression of you. And it's so difficult to undo somebody's first impression of you. And it takes work to undo it if it's negative, if, the, if it is the image that you don't want. And so think about what are you exuding? How are you dressed? Think about the audience. You're gonna wear one outfit for something else and a different outfit for something else. When I was an agent, my hair was always pulled back. I wore dark colors, I wore a suit, I wore flat, flat shoes. Mm. I had a stern look. There was a look that went with what I was doing, but that was the version of myself that I brought out. Mm. There are different versions of ourselves. There's no one you. And when I hear terms like, oh, I'm just gonna go be me and see how it goes. I'm just gonna be myself. Good luck with that. What version of you are you bringing to the table? Mm. You have to know your audience. Who are you speaking to? Mm. Because different versions of you resonate with different people. There's a version of you with your parents. There's a version of you when you do these interviews. There's a version of you with your husband. There's a version of you with your employees. So which version of you resonates with certain people? And then understanding the human being across from you, you adjust to them. One of the skills of influence, which I actually talk about in my book, is knowing who your audience is. Then based on who they are, how you assess them, you adjust yourself. You bring out the version of yourself that will speak to them, if that makes sense. Absolutely, and I love that. And do you always start with what is your goal? So like, if my goal is for this person to like me, then I adjust accordingly. If this person, uh, my goal is for this person to fear me, then I adjust accordingly. Do you, do you start with a goal like that? I won't start with a goal like that because not that I, I don't care if somebody likes me or fears me per sake because that's not my goal. My goal is what do I want? My goal is do I want to make a deal with this person? Do I want to sell a book? Do I want to do a show? Do I want to get a confession? Do I want to get an interview? That's my goal. My goal isn't how I want that person to feel about me. Interesting. Okay. My goal is what do I want? My end result is this and how do I navigate my conversation to get to that point? Now likability is important. If people like you, they're more likely to say yes to you. So, you know, that whole concept of like, I don't care if people like me, you should care mm -hmm. because it makes a difference. But going into a room saying, I want this person to like me, why? Mm. Now you're trying to figure them out and what makes them happy. It's like, well, what's your goal? Your goal is to make a partnership, do a podcast, do an interview, whatever it is. That's your goal. And then you navigate that and fear you want to be careful because do you really want people to fear you? There's some research out there, some science-based research, and one of the things that they found is those people that have the best communication skills and negotiation are better that, at influencing people are those that have two components. They are competent and they, they are warm. Mm. Okay? So we think, oh, I need to be competent and cold. That's not what resonates with people. It's competence and warmth. So how do you do that when you're walking into a room and someone's potentially killed somebody or um, like how do you be warm to that? And I've heard you say that you can't let your emotions, you know, rule you and you can't walk into any of those situations with any type of biasness. I think anyone listening has always been has been in a situation where they are biased because of their experiences and they walk into either a relationship or a friendship bringing those biases with them. Um, and taking things personally. So those are two skill sets I've heard you talk about that are so fascinating on how you actually do that. This is the thing. It's not about me. This is, it goes back to like, do I want people to like me and fear me? I'm making it about me. What's my goal? My goal is to get information, 
to get a confession, to find out did this person do it or did this person not do it. It's not about me. And what we do is our ego gets in the way. Me, 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 me. Does this person like me? This person disrespected me and I get lost. Now it's not about what I need. It's about me. And so when I walked into that room, what mattered was the information that I needed so that this person, for example, if it was a child abuse case or child sexual, sexual abuse case, and I, sadly I worked a lot of those, it wasn't about me telling this guy what I thought of him. It was about me getting information so that this guy or gal, it went both ways, couldn't hurt anybody else. That's what mattered. And so if you're able to get yourself out of the way and focus on what the long game is, the long game is I want X. How do I get to X? So me rolling my eyes, telling that person what a piece of garbage I thought he was or she was, it didn't matter. That's not what the point was. And truly, you can find something good in everybody. Mm -hmm. I interviewed hundreds of people and I can't say that I ever interviewed somebody where I was like, this person is 100% pure evil. Mm -hmm. You can find good qualities in people. And so if you can find those qualities and chase the good, I called it chasing the good. Find the good things in them and pull them out. Mm -hmm. Because if I only point out all the bad things about you and I highlight how bad you are, how horrible you are, all the bad things you did, then I'm going to pull the bad part of Lisa out. But if I can find the good parts of Lisa and say, Lisa, I know you're an honest person. Lisa, I know you meant well. Lisa, I know you didn't mean this. Lisa, I know you're a good daughter. If I can find those things about you Mm -hmm. because they exist, then I pull out the good part of Lisa and the good Lisa wants to talk wants to do the right thing, wants to communicate and work with me. The bad part of Lisa is going to go tell, flip me off and go tell me to myself, right? And so it's really being beyond yourself. People lie to me all the time. They still lie to me every day. People lie. Everybody lies. I lie. You lie. Some research says that in one conversation, a person will tell 10 lies. What? Oh, yes. We shield ourselves. And look, we lie for different things. We lie because we don't want to give you know, we don't want people to know our personal stuff. We lie to protect ourselves. We lie because we're hiding something. So if you can take that personal element out of it, oh, that person lied to me because they think I'm stupid. It probably has nothing to do with you and everything Mm -hmm. to do with them. And think to yourself, why did they lie to me? Because of something going on within them. And if you can flip it around and not take it personal, you'll be able to see what the big picture is. Short picture, short run, you hurt my feelings. Big picture, I want X, how do I get to X? Mm -hmm. God, I love that. Have you always naturally been like that? Because sometimes, at least in the past, and I've really worked on this, my emotions almost just take over without me being able to control them. And so in an effort to control them, I may walk away from a situation, take a deep breath, things like that. But when you're in that sort of high intense atmosphere, is it that you've just trained yourself enough to not get to that point of like really being emotional? Or have you always been... um, somewhat able to separate the two no so i had a terrible temper growing up okay i I wanted to fight everybody oh my god and i grew up in new york and queens god help you greek and new york you're done greek and queens is like (laughs) did you see how she looked at me hold my jacket oh my god i i saw her look at me she's gonna get it all right so how on earth did that girl from queens end up being this person that is so articulate able to explain everything self-assessment You have to constantly self-assess. I would look at situations and, for example, if I was fighting with a lot of different people in my relationships, Mm. I would think to myself, well, there's one common denominator, Mm -hmm. me. What am I doing? And I've learned over the years, if something goes wrong, not to say, what did that person do to me? I ask myself, what could I have done differently? Or what could Mm. I have done to change the outcome? Because I can't control what another person does but I can fully control myself. And you said something really remarkable and that I agree with. When you get emotional, which I still do, the best thing to do is if you can is walk away, take a break. So don't send that angry text. Don't send that email. Don't don't get on the phone. I have a 24 hour rule if I can employ it. Like just don't do anything for 24 hours. After the 24 hours, you see it differently because that emotion has passed And now you're thinking thoughtfully about what to do. There's a difference. One is you're reacting to what somebody does. And the other thing is you're responding thoughtfully. Mm. So when you react, it's impulsive. You just go. When you respond, it means you thought it out. You put some type of strategy or tactics in place. And then you respond. It's like 
when we would do search warrants or arrest warrants, we didn't just go into the you know place guns blazing and breaking doors down. It was a thoughtful, tactical breakdown of how we were going to go into that house. Where we were going to go, who's going through the doors, who's watching the back door, who's watching the windows. Are there any guns in the house? Should we be worried? Is this person not bad? A history. We put a plan in place and then we went in. We didn't go in there to be bullies or to throw down with someone. We wanted everybody to leave safely, not anyone not to get hurt. I didn't want to hurt the person either that we were arresting. And just how can we do this quickly and safely? And so it's kind of that mental breakdown of situations. Mm -hmm. But the more you deal with stress, this is the thing, the more you have stress in your life, the more you're able to cope better if you know how to use these situations as a learning tool. So when things happen to you, rather than completely losing your mind, take a minute, don't respond, don't do anything. And I have a term, introduce a disruptor. Mm. So a disruptor is something like you can do time. Time is a disruptor where you have time in the, in the context of the situation where you don't actually do anything. And the time helps you kind of break away from that moment. Or you can go do something, go surfing, uh, go jump out of a plane, go go for a run at the park, do something that disrupts the, 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 the hamster wheel that's in your head. This person this, this person that. You need to break that. Mm. So you can do that with an activity. You can even do it with a location. Move locations, change locations, get in your car and drive. So introduce disruptors. I do that to this day. If I have a situation or something that happens that I don't like and I find myself spinning and replaying that mm. same story, which does me no good, I introduce a disruptor. I'll go to my Brazilian jiu-jitsu class and I will get my ass handed to me on the grappling floor or I'll go take, take a cold shower, which I don't like doing, but I do them every night. Mm. So I will do something that alters my mindset. Wow, I love that. What up guys, let me ask you a question. Imagine what kinds of things you would achieve and what life would actually look like if every single freaking time you set a goal and you knew for a fact that you would hit him. What would you do? How fast would you make progress in your relationships, your health, your career, your finances? Here's the thing, that level of confidence is not something you're born with. It's something you can learn, something you can develop, and something you can get better over time. Let me say that again. You can learn how to set big, freaking audacious goals and crush anything that gets in your way if you have deep confidence and certainty that you can have the things in life you want. So to help you do that, and as part of the launch of my upcoming book, Radical Confidence, I've got a workshop especially for you guys called The Four Steps to Building Confidence. And guys, it's free. You can watch it by going to the link on your screen and when you're done, you will know exactly what you can do, literally starting the second that you finish watching the video, to become that freaking incredible human who knows how to hit any goal you can ever dream of. Now, bring a pen and paper, because we've got a lot of work to do. So, see you on the inside. Peace. So you're saying when you're going, I love what you're saying, like you're going in, you don't go in guns blazing, you have a plan, everything is, you know, thought out. In those moments, what happens, I want to go to like talk about um, like intuition and gut, because are there moments where you're in that situation and you've got a gut feeling about something, but you don't necessarily have any proof? Mm. Um, have you had that situation? And then what do you do about it? Because as a young girl, I definitely had a lot of gut um you know, like instincts about things, but I was always so embarrassed to say anything that I never said anything. And then I remember one time when I was about 12 years old, I was walking home from school and I just had a gut feeling someone was following me in a car. And I turned around and there was this guy in a car and he was going very slow. And I remember being like, well, if you run, like he's gonna think you're an idiot because you're running away from a car. And then I was like, but then you could die. So I actually ran home. And it's one of those moments that could have been so pinnacle in my life if I hadn't have listened to it. So you're in these moments where there's so much on the, on the line. You're, you know, you've got this, all these departments, you're maybe arresting someone, and you've got that gut feeling. So it's so interesting that you share that story. I cannot tell you how many women have shared s such a similar story. I had the same story happened where it was a woman, she was, a, she was an anchor that I had been on air with, and she pulled me aside. She said, you know what, a few years ago I was walking down the sidewalk 
and I felt somebody behind me and I felt uncomfortable, but he didn't do anything. He didn't say anything. And she's, mm -hmm. so she's like, I thought about crossing, crossing the street. I didn't do it because I didn't want to be rude because he'd be like, all right, lady, relax. She's like, I didn't cross the street. I stayed there. And you know what he did? He robbed me. Ooh. So my, in those situations, you have my blessing to be rude. Because right, right. it's not about that. It's like, let them feel offended. Or even when you're waiting online at Starbucks, if like I have one of those people who really like to be on top of me, mm -hmm. I mean, I will turn around, I'll give them a look. Or if I don't like the way I feel, I get up and leave. Mm -hmm. Move, go, don't be there. So it's really about trusting your instincts. If it feels wrong, follow it. There's actually science that the Department of Defense is doing where they're researching your sixth sense and they found that it actually works in the field and they've been investing money into it to see how you can enhance that because some of the military out in the field have been um, able to avoid IEDs, explosive devices, improvised explosive devices. And so when they asked them, how did you know not to go this way? I had a feeling. Mm -hmm. And so even if you can't articulate it, even if you don't understand it, if you feel it, follow it. There is a point where you have to trust in yourself. It's there for a reason. Trust yourself. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Is that a good enough reason? So let's say you're, I mean, you, you've protected so many presidents now. Um, have you had moments where you're, you've just had the gut feeling? And if so, do you then follow it through? Um, like, what does that look like? Well, how that would work is there's a lot of plan and preparation. So the part that you see, the agents walking around, the protectee, the president, whoever it is, mm -hmm. That's nothing. The planning and preparation that would go into the pro proactive element to securing something, going to a place, that is 80% of it. Mm. And so by the time you get there, you're pretty solid, but you've got a plan A and a plan B and a plan C for when things break bad. And if you see something that doesn't feel right, you notify the other people, hey, this looks off. What do you think? What do you think? And then collectively we make that decision. But again, if you're prepared, and this isn't, just, this isn't just in protection and security. I mean, in anything, mm. the more prepared you are, the more you've done your homework, the, the more you know about your stuff, you walk in not only confident, but super aware. And when things go wrong, you can pivot. If you're not prepared and if you mm. haven't done the work, if you're not proactive, when things go wrong, what do you do? You lose your mind. You freeze. You don't know what to do. And so there's, there's so much of that element, but we put so much work, so much strategic, so much training, so much emphasis on preparing for securing a place, securing the person, and then the what if. None of us had this delusion, oh my God, I put everything in place, it's gonna be perfect. <laughs> right. Despite all the manpower, all the research, we knew that something could go wrong. No, I could never say to anybody, I 100% tell you that this person's gonna be safe. I can guarantee it, mm. I can't. But what I can guarantee is all the stuff I'm going to do. And that if something does happen, I'm going to respond quickly, swiftly, thoughtfully, violently. Whatever I need to do. That was amazing. Um, in your business, I assume that you get confronted a lot. Um, I've heard you talk about confrontation. Most people battle it and try to fight it off. But you say welcome it. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yes. So I have a lot of folks who come up to me, what do I do? This person's confronting me. I'm nervous and I don't like to fight. And, and some people don't like confrontation. But what happens is when we go out of our way to avoid confrontation, it ends up hurting us in the end. We end up stifling our voices. We end up suffering. We end up dealing with people and things and situations where we don't speak. And it's so much worse for us, not just mentally, physically, health-wise. It just demolishes you. And so embracing confrontation is a mindset that I took on that it's like you can, you can disagree with someone and it doesn't have to be a, a full brawl. Right. You can articulate to somebody and say, I hear you, I disagree with you with this and this is why. Here's my perception of that. So there's a way to disagree with someone. And if they escalate, let them escalate. Mm. If they scream, let them scream. You sit in your chair, you stay calm and collected, you remain professional, you let them become the fool. You don't have to mimic that. Mm. Sometimes in the going back to what I used to do in the interview room, I would have people, they, they did not want to talk to me. They hated me simply because of what I represented. I represented law enforcement. Mm. And so from that moment, I'd walk into a room and people would be rude to me, scream at me, yell at me, call me names. What do I do? Do I reciprocate or do I sit back and I wait? I let them vent. And you know what? 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, they're done. They're tired. 
They got out of, the, out of their system, and now we can have a conversation. I love that so much. Don't, don't be afraid of it. Mm. So what? Somebody yells at you, and somebody confronts you, and embrace it. Look at it like, all right, what's up? Let's go. And I have to give my husband kudos for this, because anytime the situation, and there's something, I'm like, hey, this could get confrontational. He's like, yeah. <laughs> He's like, I love it. Because he looks at it almost like a puzzle, like a like a master, he's like, how can we, how are we gonna move this person? How are we gonna maneuver them from here to here? Mm -hmm. And look at it as a challenge. Mm -hmm. Don't look at it as a negative thing. And you're gonna have people confront you, but at the same time, you should be able to confront people about things that you don't feel right about in your life. Don't sit there and swallow it. Where I wanna start is with a quote that you said, my default response is to tell people to go fuck themselves. I thought you are absolutely the perfect person to help us talk about what we do when we feel like in moments we're being disrespected. And so there's a very clear story that I'm obsessed with that you have told about you and some Chinese delegates. So I want you to start with telling the story and then let's break down how on earth the girl that says she just wants to tell people to go fuck themselves is able to handle that situation with dignity. So I know what story you're referring to. So in the U.S. Secret Service, uh, a lot of people don't realize that you also protect foreign heads of state. We deal with foreign countries. So on one occasion, I was in Mexico and I was the agent in charge of, it was the G20 summit. And so all these heads of states are there to include the president at the time and the uh, head of China. And so they were having a, what they call a closed door meeting, meaning Sometimes they have these private meetings where it's the, the, the presidents and then maybe just like a handful of their uh, head cabinet members. So they're in there, their clothes are secure. I was a person in charge of the venue and the site. And so somebody from his delegation wanted to go in. Now, I, you know, I don't authorize who goes in or out. Like I just, I was the muscle, I guess you could say. <laughs> I mean, I was the muscle. And so he tried to get in. It was this, and he was huge. He was a really huge guy. And I was like, you know, sir, you can't come in. He was not happy about it. I got the State Department over my counterpart and I said, look, you're the one who has the names of everyone. Can we just double check to make sure that we didn't leave this, this man off the list? And um, she, we looked at him and we're like, no, sir, you can't come in. And he was pissed. You know, I think we like definitely insulted him. We didn't he didn't, we didn't know who he was. Like, and when you're in that type of position, like everybody is somebody, mm -hmm. everybody is somebody, everybody. And so if everybody's somebody, if everybody's important, then nobody's important. So he kind of tried to sneak in. I wouldn't let him. And then he got very angry with me and he put hands on me and uh, he grabbed me by my suit and like shoved me. And when he shoved me back, the doors to where the, pre the presidents were meeting were behind. So he literally shoves me through and we, I banged through the doors and then I had this moment because I wasn't expecting it. You know, you can expect to fight with certain people when I'd go out for an arrest or somebody wasn't complying. I would expect that type of behavior, but I didn't expect it from like this high level delegate who I still don't know who he is. And, you know, I had this voice in my head and this is where I went from Secret Service to like back to Queens. I'm like, I'm oh, the fuck he didn't. I'm like, this guy just put hands on me. I'm like, oh, fuck no. I grabbed, you know, I grabbed him by a suit collar and I just shoved him back into all the Chinese delegates that were there. And um, they, so he turned out to be a general. I had no idea. And so they, they all jumped on top of me. And I remember like one delegate pulled me off. Another delegate like put me in a chokehold. Somebody slammed me up against the wall and I've got all these foreign delegates on me. And I'm like, fuck you, game on. <laughs> All in front of the president of the United States. Now he, so what happened is we, we backed into his office, the doors opened where they were meeting. And then we went back in the hallway. Oh, okay. We're brawling. And then thankfully, like somebody alerted some of my colleagues who were like further down. And then, you know, that's when the interpreter came over and he said, shame on you, you touched one of our generals. And I'm like, Pfft. I was like, you tell your general that picking fights with ladies isn't very, you know, general-like. So, but you know, I had to control that rage. I'm in the middle of a G20 summit. And you just got to reel it in. But at the same time, you have to defend yourself. Like, I am not about violence. Like, you know, violence is like such an obvious way to fight. And quite frankly, it's a very insecure way to fight. Mm. People who are overly aggressive and violent because you're so afraid and you feel like you it's like overcompensation. And I feel like if I'm going to waste my energy on you, it better be worth it. Mm. Yeah.
I love that. This is what I really want to talk about. The amount of people, obviously your case is super extreme, but you're a freaking expert. But your everyday person like myself and the people listening, it's you get disrespected often. There are certain things where people cross a boundary, cross a line, um, and it's very difficult in that moment to stay cool, to um, know how to handle it. And then even if you get yourself super angry, to be able to calm down back to neutral. So. What are the elements that you feel like are important for people to build? Because like I said at the beginning, I really do believe it's a skill. And it's a skill to know how to handle and navigate different situations. So when someone physically crosses your boundary, um, and let's say you don't have the physical skills to actually fight them off, what do you suggest people do? Okay, so this is heavy. This is like so many layers. So let me say one thing first. First, before we, we, we start assessing another person, it's me first. I have to have self-control. If I don't have self-control over myself, if I, don't, if I cannot master myself, forget about the outside world. So it always has to begin with you. So knowing that I am hot-headed and knowing that my first inclination is to tell people to go fuck themselves, which is true, I know that I have work to do. So I'm very aware of that and I'm very aware that that is not the right thing to do. So I don't say this like, yeah, bravado. I say this like, yeah, this is a, a, a trait of mine that I've had to work very, very hard to kind of curtail and rein in. God, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but there's something super powerful here. What made you go from you being that to acknowledging you're that and then acknowledging it doesn't serve you? Because I was fighting with everybody. And you just said something must be wrong here? Like what? Yes, I was wrong. If I'm fighting with this person and that person and even my dad, you know, we, I used to fight with my dad all the time because I didn't agree with the way he thinks. I love my dad, just put that out there. But we would fight all the time. And then one day I'm like, why am I fighting with all these people? Why am I trying to convince everybody of what I think? I'm like, and I, I really started to have like this thoughtfulness because if you're fighting with everybody, if, every, if you're having problems at work, you're having problems at home, you're having problems with friends, if you're having problems with everybody, there's one common denom denominator and it's, it's me and I would see that. And so I was like, I got to reel me in. Plus, like, it's exhausting. <laughs> and I have no time. I realize I'm, I'm wasting energy fighting with people. And I'm not saying that some people don't deserve to be put in their place. But I guess I look at it like, are you worth my time? Most people aren't. So you have to choose that. So going back to what you ask first, it's self-mastery. You got you to gotta have yourself locked down. You got to have emotional intelligence over self. It's a Greek saying, know thyself. Mm -hmm. You don't know thyself, nothing else, nothing else I can teach you matters. Now, if you know and understand yourself, then at that point, betrayal, I think there's different levels, Lisa, hmm. of betrayal, of disrespect. Like if it's some Yahoo on the street who's giving me a hard time, like road rage or whatever, I, I don't care. I'm busy, I gotta go somewhere. So like, I would, I would not entertain that stuff. So I guess I think of it like, are you worth me responding to? Do I have to respond to you? But I also do think like you have to be super careful because if you let some, a lot of things go, then you will have people who will test you. Yes. And truth be told, like I, I can see people and I've experienced it myself. Like I feel like every five years I have like a betrayer like show up. Ooh. That's how, every, like every couple of years I'm due one person to like really cross that line because I really do avoid the, you know, I avoid the drama because I focus on my work, I focus on my family, and I, and I avoid putting my energy into negative things and people. But I think you will have people test the waters with you. you. I love the quote, you teach people how to treat you. Yeah. So it's literally the more you let things go, the more they're like, oh, I can do this, and they're not going to retaliate. So where, so how, t tell me every version then of levels of disrespect and how you actually handle each stage. Yeah. So you know what? Let me share this. This is what happens to us. There's there's some science, there's some research they've done in the, the chemistry of the brain. And and it comes to trust. And this is where we feel usually disrespected. Like, and this is on a higher level. This is where it hits us deeper. So when you trust, there's two types of trust. There's conditional trust and unconditional trust. Mm -hmm. Now, conditional trust is I'm going to do a business deal. I'm going to buy a car from a salesman. So when you deal with conditional trust, you access a, a higher level of your, your brain. And when you access this complicated place of your brain, 
you are trusting conditionally, which, which means you're working very hard. You understand this person will manipulate you. You understand that you can only trust them conditionally. Mm -hmm. And you do expect some type of maybe betrayal or lies or something to happen. Mm -hmm. But you work very, very hard when you're in that space. So when that person betrays you, like that you bought a car and the car salesman, you know, screws you over, you're like, you know what? I didn't like that guy. Mm -hmm. I knew he was going to do that. I kind of felt it. You're, you're upset, but it's not like this deep thing. That's conditional trust. That's a lot of work though. Now, unconditional trust, the, the science shows that access is a different part of our brain, a more primitive part of our brain. Mm. And this is where we like to live because it's less work. So this is like the trust you have with your partner. This is the trust you have with a family member or a close friend, which means I'm not working so hard because I'm giving you all this unconditional trust. But then what happens is when they betray you because you don't expect to get betrayed like you did with the car salesman or in a business negotiation. So when you get this kind of betrayal, this is when it crushes you. And this is where you have such a hard time getting over it. This is where you see people going through a divorce or a painful friendship or where they have that deep you know, betrayal and they're like, they can't overcome it. And I think it helps for you to understand why that is. Because of, and it truly, there's science behind it. It's like understanding, am I trusting this person conditionally or unconditionally? So although we like to trust people unconditionally, and I have been there, I've trusted unconditionally, and I have been betrayed, it's going to happen to all of us. I think, though, we set triggers or red flags for us to know it, to know when it's going to happen. If you're just open to everybody all the time, you're, gonna, you're just going to be inviting it in all the time. So you do have to create those barriers for yourself, but you also have to do your self-assessment of people. Like, who am I going to let into my inner circle? You are in my inner circle, you know, like I, I, I select the people in my inner circle. And I think like, you know what, you should have people audition in a <laughs> sense, right? You should audition to be in my life. And that's where your self-worth comes in. Wow. That was so articulate and amazing. And so then my next question is then when we let the people in, at least for me, I find it even more difficult when they disrespect me or if they've crossed the boundary. I find it way more difficult to handle in those situations. And I think that I allow my, like you were saying, um, the unconditional, like the, my guard is way less down. So I let them get away, quote unquote, with more things. So you, you've repeated multiple times emotional intelligence. So I'd love to kind of break that down even more and say and and um, put the two together on how you build the emotional intelligence and then how you use that in these situations, whether it's a work colleague or it's someone very close to you. Yeah. So when we talk about a work colleague or anything like that or issues like that, I mean, I've experienced those. I remember once I had a work colleague, this is my previous career when I was in the service, um, reprimand me and he was an equal to me uh, mm -hmm. about a case, about something that he thought I was supposed to do that I wasn't supposed to do. And he had just kind of like gotten sort of an elevated position and I think he wanted to put on a bit of a show mm -hmm. and he did this in front of people. And it's like everything in me to not like rip him to shreds. So I knew he was wrong. I went and got the case file or whatever I needed. And I went back downstairs and I, I stepped away because I really like nothing, nothing good was going to come out of my mouth. But I also understand that it was work. And I also understood that there was people around me. And I was like, you're not going to own my response to you. I'm going to own it. That's why I do it for me, not for you. So I got the case. I grabbed him and I'm like, hey, we'll call him Jay. I'm like, hey, Jay. I'm like, come here. I'm like, I want to speak to you. And I remember I pulled him into the stairwell and to speak to him in private, because I learned through my interviewing techniques that when you want to let somebody know what you really think of them or when you want to reprimand somebody or discipline someone in some way, you should do it in private. Because I knew if I ripped him in front of everybody, he just would have ripped me back mm. and we would have gotten nowhere. Because he's, he's naturally going to get defensive because I embarrassed him. Shame is a big thing. So I pulled him to the side of the stairwell. I said, here you go. This is what you're saying you need. This is what was done. And I'm like, this is the thing. I gave you the courtesy of pulling you into the stairwell to speak to you in private. You've known me how many years? I've never spoken to you like that again. Today was the first and last time you're going to speak to me like that again. I was like, do you understand? And I'm giving you more respect 
than you deserve because I'm addressing you here in private. Have I ever spoken to you this way? And he's like, no. And I'm like, don't ever do that again. Here you go. Next time, come speak to me with decency and respect. But I was also able to do that and he was also able to absorb it again because I did it in private. Now, I'm not saying they're all going to go smoothly like that for everybody, but you choose when and how you respond. And so I want, for me, it's like I own what I'm going to do. I can't own what you do, but I can own what I do. But when I feel that rage, because I feel it all the time, I really, when I can, I step away. Now that to me, like, honestly, that's like lo low vibration. Like stuff like that, when you deal with people like that, that, always think low vibration, low vibration. Like this person, this is silly. Like, and most of the times it is, and most of the time you're dealing with people's egos. Now, when we're elevating to like people, I have to be honest, my inner circle is small. And I've just learned when I was younger, I had friends everywhere. And now this is my friend and that's my friend. And I realized over years, I'm like, they're not all friends. And what matters is the quality of the people you keep to you. And I, I'm very thoughtful, but there are certain standards that I create for myself. So it kind of goes back to what you said about treatment. And I say, you get what you tolerate. Mm -hmm. So if I know someone's lying to me, I'll be thoughtful as far as why they're lying to me, because sometimes people will lie out of fear. They'll lie because they're ashamed. And I will work to see if that person will be truthful with mm -hmm. me or if they hold back for a reason. But when somebody lies and they really hurt me, betray me, at least for me, Lisa, I'll tell you this, when I'm done, when I make that conscious choice to be done with someone, I'm done with them. You know, when I feel that kind of betrayal. And again, I, I feel like every five years, but usually those betrayals, those deep ones come from someone close to you. It's not gonna be usually an acquaintance. It's gonna be a family member. It's gonna be a, a, a relationship. It's gonna be all those different things. But you also have to have enough common sense to know when to walk away when to know when to be done. How do you know that? Because so many people struggle with that, of knowing when to be done and walking away. If somebody's lying to you, you walk away. I remember I had uh, someone reach out to me, and this, is go this goes with her partner, and she suspected her partner of being unfaithful. Mm. She was asking me for help, for advice. I think she actually wanted to polygraph her partner. And I'm like, <laughs> so when I heard that, I'm like, you want to polygraph your partner? And she was like, yes. I was like, I think you need to re reassess your relationship. The minute <laughs> yelled words, I, I knew. I'm like, this, she's done. This relationship's done. So I do the opposite. I'm like, oh, come in. Have a cup of tea. What are you trying to tell me? And in that has allowed me to go, oh, it's not that you're worried that you're a woman compared to a man. It's that you're not prepared. You're not listening. So I know less. Great. Learn more oh, I'm not prepared for this meeting. Great, be prepared. And that's been the biggest freaking flip. I really do think that confidence isn't just, it's not like genetics. It's not like you're just, you have it or you don't. I really do think it's like a skill that you cultivate. And people think of confidence as being the end goal. But really it's, I think you build it by gaining competence. And in order to gain competence, you have to start somewhere. And that means you start when you're not competent. You are right about you're not, some people may be born with it, but most of the time it's cultivated. Confidence is habit. Are the habits mm -hmm. that you have on a day-to-day -day basis, do they make you confident or do, do they demolish you? Mm -hmm. So language, which is what you initially opened up with, how we, peop we speak to ourselves, how we think of ourselves, so that's kind of like the foundation. If you don't have a healthy dialogue with yourself, then it doesn't, it doesn't matter what other people do to you. You're, you're diminishing yourself. So I really think about the way I speak to myself. Mm. I, I won't call myself lazy um, if I feel unmotivated because there's nothing lazy about me. I won't say, Evie, you're so stupid. If I make a mistake, I'm going to make mistakes. I will not speak that way to myself because when you speak that way to yourself, at least for me, mm -hmm. I, I push myself down. So nobody else needs to do anything mm -hmm. to crush me. I just crush myself. Think about the daily habits that I use from day to day, moment to moment, that help build and shape and mold my confidence. It doesn't happen overnight. And I think language, internal dialogue, is one of the most important things you know, not calling yourself an idiot because you misplaced the keys. Little mm. things like that. I used to, and it was very detrimental to my self-esteem. Very detrimental. Lisa, you're so fucking dumb. Like, and it would really tear me down. 
And now going back to the negative voice, I'm like, it just used to tear me down and I can't switch it off. So how do I in, on earth get confidence in something when I don't have like even the confidence to do one little thing or even speak nicely to myself? So I had to flip it and go, okay, if I don't know something, instead of tearing myself down, be like, okay, you don't know this, but now I can learn. Instead of saying, hey, Lisa, you're so dumb, you don't understand this. Do, I, you, do you do that still? I used to, no, I don't anymore. But that was definitely um, what I used to say. You're, so, you, you're dumb, you just don't get it. I removed the word dumb because that does not serve me. Again, going to what language serves you, you should use it. What language doesn't serve you, you shouldn't use it. So that doesn't serve me on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what I say in those situations is you don't get this, but you can learn. And just by giving myself the grace of saying, hey, you don't get it, but you can learn, allows me to go, oh, well, then how do I learn? I have to ask. And then it flips it from, oh, I'm getting more powerful now. I can get even better. And that framing now doesn't stop me. It, for, it encourages me to keep putting my hand up. Going, I don't get it. Don't understand. Sorry, don't get it. Like, it really does allow me to just push forward in the most positive sense instead of being, being held back. Where do you think that negative language came from? Like you gave me the examples, you said, I used to talk to mis myself this way. How does, how does that happen? Oh God, there's many things. But I think for me, it was, I grew up in a family where my older brother and sister were very good academically. So we would sit around a table, Greek family, we would sit around a table and my dad would like throw out math quizzes. Now, I'm the artist in the family. So you can imagine I get thrown a math question. My brother and sister can go bam, 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 bam. And I hesitate. So just that alone puts me just growing up every day feeling less than. Then going to school, I completely excelled at art and totally struggled at academics, math, English, like completely struggled. So it built up a self-esteem issue. And then, you know, I think like anything is you get told it enough, you start to believe it, then you believe it. It doesn't matter what happens to you. Even if you start excelling after that, it becomes a part of you. And so I just realized I just have to unwind it. Like instead of beating myself up that it exists because I can't change my past, the 25-year-old, the 30-year-old Lisa knows better, knows that it doesn't serve me, but it's a habit. You even said, right, at the beginning, it's a habit. So don't beat yourself up. I've got a bad habit and now I just need to change it. I need to give myself the grace to acknowledge it exists and now work on every day unwiring it, changing that habit. And that habit came from every time I go to call myself dumb, call myself the student. Every time I go to say, Lisa, you don't have the fucking confidence, say yet, right? So I don't have the confidence yet, but I'm going to do it anyway. So reframing, re-saying these phrases, I don't have the confidence yet. Like literally, I'll just keep repeating it. Every time I get scared, Repeat it, repeat it, repeat it until you act. You know, it's interesting. I won't do the yet thing because I don't want to find myself in the future. I want to find myself now. Mm. When I hear that, I think, no, I need her now. Ah. And I don't know, like, if maybe when I do my mentor session, sometimes people will say to me, I want to be confident. I want to be this. And I'll tell them, how about you just are that now? And I'll make them write up kind of a paperwork and I'll ask them, what have you done? I'll ask them about their strengths and all that. And I'll read it. And I'll say, I mean, you're already confident. Do you, mm. do you not see this? Did you read mm. like all the things you've done? Did you read all the things you've experienced? The trauma, the things you've overcome in life? I kind of think you're already her. Mm. And so I uh, maybe- Is that really true though? Yes, so I think so. Because in that, I th because I think we have moments where we're here, then mm. we go here. And then we're here, and then we go here. So I think you're, you're there, but you choose not to maybe tap into that. I have my moments where maybe I'll lack confidence in something because I don't know it, I don't understand it, but I have developed that mindset of, I deserve to be here, wherever here is. Like, and maybe, maybe this is where I'll bring in negative language. I've kind of been like, well, that bozo can do it. <laughs> it's so fascinating because you're right. We, we take different um, framing of how we're thinking about it in an effort to improve ourselves in the now. Because for me, it is very empowering to be like, you could be, Lisa, you could be anything you fucking want to be. Even if you're not that person now, you can be it. Like, I get so excited about the dream of just set your mind to it. What do I want to be? And how the hell do I get there? Like, that's so exciting to me. But I actually understand that how you frame it still is empowering, right? It's like, you're that person. Come on, you're that person. Like, I get the... I think when you have people write down, I have people write down what they've accomplished. Mm. 
what they've done, even if it's a negative trauma or experience, I'll have them write it out and then I'll, I'll lift it up. I'm like, how does somebody who's overcome this not have confidence? It really does tie into what I was saying about um, competence, that you need the competence. By showing someone, hey, you don't think of yourself necessarily right now as confident, but look at these things. And by um, focusing and highlighting these things, it shows that they've actually built the competence, they just don't realize it. Look, 50% is what the world does to you, but 50% is you. This you can manage. And so if you want to be those things and you want to change those things, then it's something you can do. When you manage your confidence and belief in who you are and why you are there and why you are doing something and you drown out the noise because a lot of times it is noise, you will focus kind of like on your goal. What's my mission? What's my goal? What's my end result? But if you waste your time listening to the negative language of other people and then letting it live inside of you, then it becomes part of you. Mm. And I think if you can recognize this is part of me, how do I maybe either sit down and have coffee with it? Or, you know, for someone like me, it's like, just shut the door. <laughs> either way. <laughs> Nobody's home. <laughs> you know, in talking about confidence, I guess if I had to say there's one thing that I specifically do that helps me, it really would be to over-prepare. Preparation has been I guess you could say my secret weapon to helping me. So when I look back at all the different things I've, I've done, so like, for example, when I was in the Secret Service, I, I actually was not very good with the, um, the academic stuff. I've never actually been good with academics. I really had to put time and work, work on it. But then when you go through training, they teach you legal jargon, things that I'd never done law. I didn't know this world. And my first exam, actually, I failed it. My first legal exam in the service, I, I remember failing it and thinking, I can't blow this. And I realized that I had to put in more than everybody else. The way I could learn, I, 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 I would write everything. So I would hand write the textbook as a way to, to learn. I didn't really share it with a lot of people because people thought it was nuts, an extreme, but when I would have these opportunities, I didn't want to lose them. Mm. But one of the things that calm me to this day is over-preparing. Mm. So when I'm over-prepared, it's one less thing I have to worry about, right? I know what I'm going to say or I'm prepared in that I have knowledge or that I've studied. So when I'm over-prepared, now I can actually focus on other things. It actually elevates my confidence in that I understand what I'm going to speak about, I'm going to understand what I'm going to be tested on. It's not an easy thing because you'll look at other people and say, well, that person doesn't have to put in all that time. Why do I? Mm -hmm. We're all quite different. But for me, over-preparing has definitely helped me to boost my confidence. Even after I left the Secret Service and I began working in television, I didn't understand journalism. I didn't understand TV. And I didn't like feeling like that. I would feel I lacked confidence mm. because I didn't understand it. So I went and I applied to Columbia University Journalism Schools, one of the hardest schools to get Did into you? as an adult. Mm. I left the U.S. Secret Service and I applied to go back to school, to college as an adult. And I got in and then I studied journalism and I got my master's degree there mm. because I needed to feel like I understood what I was doing. And I over-prepared. So you literally were like, okay, I'm going from this to this. I want to be in journalism now. I actually don't know what the hell I'm doing. So I have zero confidence because I have, don't have the competence yet. And so you went and that was your solution of like, get studying really hard so that I go into it with confidence. So yes. Gonna... Actually, you just said it. Competence equals confidence. Yeah. When we talk about pressure, when we talk about self-esteem and sticking up for yourself, like all these subjects, I honestly think you're the freaking expert because you've got actual training and so this, it's so powerful, but then once you bring emotion in it, right, it becomes slightly different. So, but I also mess up. I've messed up. Right, which I think is amazing. That's the thing. Like I've, I don't know how many times I've messed up. Mm -hmm. And so, but I, it's when I've messed up that I'm like, man, I shouldn't have done that. Man, I shouldn't have said that. But I, this is the, the, the difference. I choose to learn from it. Mm -hmm. And I choose to make it a lesson. Whereas other people are like, yeah. And then you wonder, why you're messing up all over the place. Mm -hmm. Like I, 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 I look at things and I assess things and I, I'm truly honest with myself. Like every night 
I say, to, I say to myself one thing, what could I have done better today? What could I have done differently today? Because I, I take accountability and when I take accountability, man, I flow. But when I, I'm, when I don't, I hit walls. I, I, I understand that I don't know everything. And is that because you know yourself so well? Because what I love is, and I think this is why we get along so well, we think very similarly. Like I'm the same, it's like, what can I do better? Because it empowers me to do better. But I know a world where a lot of people, even asking that same question at the end of the day, a lot of people in this space that I've also interviewed have said, I always say like, it's okay, Lisa, like, what did you do great today? And it's self-soothing. And I actually understand that part of it, but I'm like you as well. I also have the other side that at the end of the day, I'm like, what could you have done better? How do you use that to empower yourself and not to shame yourself for doing things wrong? No, I don't shame myself. So then, how, yeah, tell me, how no. does that so not I can, feel shame? But you can be both. You can be like, what could I have done better? And it's like, okay, I could have done this better. I messed up and I will say to myself, that's okay. So mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. I do, you can do, you can be both. You can hold yourself accountable and be like, I messed up, who hasn't? Who hasn't? And it's all right. It's like, all right, you messed up. Move on. Yeah. And there needs to be no shame. Yeah. Because it's so important the way you talk to yourself and treat yourself and speak to yourself. Like I wouldn't tolerate somebody else being like shame on you. So why would I shame myself? I understand and take accountability. I messed up. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have said this. If I need to apologize to someone, I will. It's very rare now. <laughs> but I will own it. I will own it. Like if you're going to a relationship, like if I argue with my, my significant other, or even with my mom, I go back and I'm like, you know what? I'll, in that moment, I'll be like, I was right. And then five hours later, I'm like, no, I didn't need to do that. I'll go and I'll say, I'm very sorry. So I really think apologizing is good. But then you also don't want to get into this mindset where you're constantly apologizing for how you feel and who you are. Mm. Apologize when you need to, but that mindset and that language also pulls you back into this subordinate place. Apologies are important when you need to apologize, but when you don't, like if I argue with my significant other, I'll be like, I'm not apologizing for this one. Mm. Not because I'm right, but because it's not, the situation isn't right. And I want to address this with you. I will hold it. God, I love that. And I, um, I want to actually talk about verbal currency is what you call it, I think. Verbal economics. Uh, yeah, verbal economics. Um, because I'm so with you. So even with my husband as well, we literally have this language where he's, he will say, or I will say to him, I'm sorry I've hurt you, but I'm not sorry about what I said. Like what I said, I actually still mean. And if I apologize for what I said, then it seems like I don't actually mean it. No, I'm sorry I hurt you. And I'm sorry that, um, like, what words can I maybe change that didn't hurt you? But my point is still the same. And if I feel strongly in the point, I don't want to apologize for it because then it seems like I'm kind of backtracking out of emotion, right? Because like, oh, I've hurt him, so I'm sorry. Um, and I actually don't think that solves any issue. No, but I think what you're doing is right. But you also have to acknowledge that you did something, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, it upset him. So it's not Correct. like, well, I didn't mean it that way. Well, it doesn't matter how you meant it. This is how I took exactly. it. But sometimes I will apologize because I'll be like, I'm sorry we fought or yeah. I'm sorry for what I said or I'm sorry for my behavior um, because I, I am hot-headed. And, you know, usually it's to the people closest to us that we will keep our composure mm -hmm. out in public typically or with work and it's, we lose it at home. And that's no good either because that's how you lose people. That's how you hurt people. Like we're not, you're not meant to come home and dump on people. And that's something to be very careful of. So I came from a very high stress environment. And even after I left the service, working in television, in the industry, like there's so much stress. I had to be very mindful of that, to take that out on the people I go home to. They're not there to be your dumping ground because at some point, like you're going to affect them. And then you're going to end up like, where is everyone? Everyone left you because you're, you're, you're dumping all your stuff on them. Like they have a day, they... They're going through, their, everyone's going through something. And so self-assessment is such a huge thing. And I, you know, I go by like, I'm not always right. Humility is a big thing. Like people need to have that. I don't know where that's gone. Everyone knows everything. Everybody's super self-righteous. Like have some humility. You don't know anything. None of us do. Oh, oh where does Socrates, it was, uh, Socrates, I believe said this. He said, I know I'm smarter than you because I know I don't know everything. <laughs> 
And that's how I feel. And so when I feel people going, 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 like that self-righteousness or that like I know everything, like tune out. Mm. I'm like, okay, I do the head nod. I'm like, so great talking to you. I'm going to go do business elsewhere. I'm going to go hang out elsewhere. And I'm really like thoughtful about the inner circle I, I, I keep because I want to grow as a human being. And if I keep negativity and people who don't control themselves well, and that's another thing as far as pressure, be around people who, who handle pressure well so you can learn from them. I watch other people. Do you know, working in the White House, that was a huge, like it was, it was going to like school every day. Because I would watch the presidents, the first ladies, deal with serious pressures. And I'd watch how they handle themselves and I'm like, note to self. Yeah. They would, they would deal with horrible messages or emails or hate or all these different things. And they would wake up and he, the president of the United States, he still has to go to work. He still has to run the country. He can't just sit there and fall apart. You have to keep yourself composed. But at the same time, they surround themselves by what? Other people who help keep them strong. That's, you have a cabinet. And so I look at myself as like, I'm not the president, but in my mind, I'm like, I'm me. Who's my cabinet? Who are my cabinet members? And who do I go to when I need help? So if I'm about to like do something or say something, I may call you, Lisa, and be like, Lisa, man, I just had this business thing. I know this is your space. I'm like, I'm about to lose my shit. Can I talk to you? So I'll, I'll do it with you. So I don't do it elsewhere, but I'm mindful of where I project that. Now I'm mindful not to dump on you, but I'll go to you because I feel like you, you're the, you know the space. Mm. Teach me. So I think that there's so many different outlets. It's like assessing yourself, surround yourself with strong people. If you're around people who like lose their shit, guess what you're going to do? Lose your shit and don't mimic other people. When they escalate, don't, don't, don't follow the, don't follow. I get trapped in that all the time. I really do. I've noticed that about me. I keep calm. I keep calm. I keep calm. But then like after a certain moment, like if someone keeps escalating, I keep calm. I'm like, Lisa, you're doing good. You're doing good. People escalate. Lisa, it's okay. You're doing good. And then they just keep escalating. At some point, I freaking just but like. But when you, when you escalate, what do you do? Do you yell? Do you, what do you do? Yeah, my, I, my tone gets louder. My voice gets louder. I get harder. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I've been in spaces like that. When I feel that, I really remove myself. I go, I go, I go yeah. quiet. So you said something earlier, like I go silent. When I can't keep composure, I go silent. Mm. If I disappear from someone's life, mm. I'm done. Or I've gone silent. Like I'll remove myself or even the situation and I'll come back. But if I can keep composure, like I will assert myself. Like you have authority assert it and authority doesn't mean being a jerk mm. authority doesn't mean being condescending and in fact authority is a strong influence tactic when you are perceived as an authority in something people will acquiesce to you more this is why we acquiesce so much to to doctors because we see them as authority law enforcement because they've got a uniform on financial advisors so many people acquiesce to them because we see them as an authority. Meanwhile, like they could have graduated at last in their class. And so, but when you assert yourself as an authority in body posture, in voice, in speech, in how you present yourself, people are less likely to mess with you. So from the onset, like I had to learn this a lot in the interview room when I would interview people who were criminals, who would see me and be like, oh man, this is going to be an easy day. Because I, I worried about that initially, mm. but I controlled that from the moment I met that person, from the moment I met them, from the moment. Break it down. What do you mean by that? Hi, how are you? I'm Evie, Pompurus. Nice to meet you. And if I wanted to throw in special agent, I freaking would. Hi, I'm special agent Pompurus. Nice to meet you. Come with me. Now, granted, this was an interview environment, but I set the tone. Now this person understands that I, she's an authority here. I established myself as an authority. And that's really, really important. So I won't be passive. Passive is no-go because that, that builds up and then you blow up on people. But if I'm also dealing with someone who's like, I'm sorry, a buffoon, I'm done dealing with you. I will minimize my detailing, my, my, my dealing with you. I'll deal with you via email if I have to. I'll pull back. I'll have my manager deal with you. I'm like, hey, I don't want to talk to this guy. This guy's a bozo. I know I got to work with him. Can you handle him? Talk to me about that because I'm such an um, advocate for like, Words matter. The words you use for yourself and the words you use to others 
um, can signify either with yourself that you're inferior or um, superior. Um, and then to others, whether you feel, because like you said, right, authority. So the language that you use in order to express the authority, I assume, is extremely important. Um, what are the things that you feel make all the difference in that situa- in situations? So verbal economics is actually didn't come from me. It came from my one of my former colleagues, Lee, who's a great interviewer and negotiator. And he said, he we talked about language and he said, he turned the coin because we were talked about how important it is the words we use because we would be very mindful of the words we use when we would talk to people because certain words can put people off and cert- you know make them shut down and other words can invite them in and make you appear more open and they communicate with you more. So he would call it verbal economics, meaning we live in a time where we think, I have to say everything I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. Like I was mentoring this woman once. She's like, you know, I talk really fast because I'm trying to get everything I'm thinking out of my mouth. And I'm like, Why? Choose what you let out. Not every idea that pops into your head should you verbalize. Because when you do that, you're not putting weight into your words. So verbal economics means choosing your words thoughtfully. And then what you're about to say, think of it as money. Right. And the more powerful and impactful the words, the more money you're putting down. It's currency that you're using with another human being. And if those words you're using have currency, have weight, They're going to impact that person more. But if you're just like spewing out everything you're thinking, there is no currency there because nothing is really truly a value. Mm. Look, it's going to happen where people and things are going to come out the wrong way or say the wrong thing. But when you can slow it down and really use this, this mindset of verbal economics, my words matter and they have weight, that they impact another human being in some way. And it can impact them in a positive or negative way. And it can also impact me whether what I get from that relationship is positive or negative. So how do you start assessing which are the high dollar bills and the low dollar bills? It depends on the situation. Like with, I talk about priming a lot in the book mm. and priming is you can prime people to, to be more open with you. And it's actually a good negotiators, good people who do business before you do a pitch, We used to have the saying, even in the interview room, your opening line, you should always write that thing down. That should be rehearsed. You should never fly by the seat of your pants. That opening line is going to be the defining, the defining moment and how the rest of your conversation is going to go. Mm-hmm. So like priming words, you know, hi, I'm Evie. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for having me. I, I can't wait to talk to you about the partnership and create an open relationship and an honest one where we can cooperate together. Now in there, I threw in priming words, open, cooperative relationship. So I'm priming you to want to work with me to create this open environment. You can also do that with your environment as far as like having open space, letting people not feel closed in. You can prime situations and people, talking to people, uh, man tables. Like I like I could teach people who do interviews or talk to people like and you do you're solid, you have open space here, but people do negotiations and they have tables between them. Biggest 101 fundamental, never negotiate with somebody with a table between you two. I, I, I taught this interviewing thing for realtors and how to sell better. I did a speaking presentation and they work so hard to like get people to connect with them, to sell them like property and all this stuff. And then they go to sit down to do paperwork. And what do they do? You worked all this time to build this rapport. And the minute you sit down at the table, you just killed it. Because now it went from an informal, hey, we're buddies to like, all right, sit down and do business. And think about moments somebody sits down and does business. What do everybody do? They straighten up. Okay. Mm-hmm. We're going to do business now. Okay, I'm going to do my interview now. I don't want that guy or gal. I want the person before. I want my buddy. And you have a table. I've heard you say the table and you can't actually see their body. And the whole point is to read no. people's body language. Oh, yeah. How can I read somebody's? One, tables work as barriers. Right. So they are psychological barriers. There's me and then there's you. Even I teach. I have a podium. I never stand behind my podium. I come mm. out from the podium. I walk through the aisles of my classroom because I let my students know, hey, it's not me and then you. Right. It's us. I'm then, here with you. Are we doing dates wrong then? Because people go on dinner dates. No, for a date, you don't know this dude or guy. Like You want to have some space between ah. you. Like Me walking through the aisle and having a couple of feet between me is different. When you're sitting at a table, what are you talking about? One to two feet? Not on a date, Like I would be super thoughtful, especially if you don't know somebody. Like First dates, especially using apps or whatever, you really got to be mindful about who you meet. Public places, the first few dates. Definitely have some space. 
monitor that space like between you and that person. Don't give personal information. Don't have them come pick you up at your home. I know I just went on a tangent with this, but I have so many people ask me about this and I'm like, you, get, you, get to be, you have to be really careful. Don't trust unconditionally. Like you don't know people. Mm. I really like that because if you know that you're about to put yourself under pressure, whether it's a date or whether it's a job interview, or whether it's something else, having these tactics of like how far to sit from someone. Like I think about a lot of things. I don't even think about that or like how that would impact you. But I think about, this is what happens. When you're under pressure, you think about who? Yourself. Mm. And you, you, that's all you're thinking about. Me, 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 I, 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 I'm under pressure, I'm under this. And you're not thinking about the person across from you. One of the ways I deflect pressure too for myself is I'll think about that person. I forget about me that I'm gonna present, I'm gonna speak, I'm going on camera. And what I do is to relieve the pressure off of me, I'm like, what does that person want? And so when I can focus on who the recipient is, I forget about myself. So that is truly another tactic. Like I just shot something, a uh, project here, and you know I wanted to make sure I did a really good job when we were shooting. And I took it back to like, I'm delivering something for the viewer, someone who, something somebody's gonna see. And so that's what matters. So I took myself out of it. I'm nervous, I'm, I wanna do a good job, me. And I made it about them. What do they need to see? What do they need to hear so that it feels impactful and authentic? And that takes, that distracts me from me. But if you're presenting something, so to speak, be prepared. Like a big part of pressure is not being prepared. And if you're prepared, that's one less thing you have to worry about. If you got on the right outfit, that's one less thing you have to worry about. Mm -hmm. If your hair and makeup are done in the same, in the way you, you feel confident, that's one less thing you have, you have to worry about. So I look at it as columns. Let's say I'm nervous about something, right? I'm nervous about speaking because I'm just nervous and I, the pressure of speaking. So here's that column, speaking. I'm like, all right, here's where I have a struggle, but where, what other columns can I control? Well, I can control what I wear, so I feel good and strong, and I can control how I look, and I can control how much I prepare, and I can control my prior linguistics, my voice, my speech, my rate. I can so I'll check all these other boxes where here, it's like, all right, here I'm still kind of flailing a bit, but I control all these other things. Because you can go into a situation, and again, going back to my previous career where we would go into situations, have all these protocols in place, but in the end, I don't know how someone's going to respond or react or if there's going to be an attack or whatever it's going to be, but I control all these other verticals. I'm prepared. I'm wearing, I'm, I've got my gear on. I've got my shoes on that I need to run or fight with or whatever. My hair's pulled back. I'm confident. I got a good night's sleep. Whatever I need to do, I checked all those boxes so that when something does break bad or there is pressure, I'm, I'm, I'm good here. I just got to worry about here. I love that. God, every time I talk to you, like the thing that always just screams so much is you just take ownership. You take ownership over your actions. You take ownership over the outcomes. And I heard you in your book talk about taking ownership over the outcome. And a lot of people give, I like to say, give away their power by saying, but this person advised me, this person told me to do this. And so they're giving away their ownership over the situation. But I've heard you talk about like, no, even if other people give advice, it's on you. Um, talk to me about that. Have you always felt like that? Um, how do you do that? And how do you do that? And not going back to the shame thing, take ownership over it, but not shame so yourself. I it. love what you just said, because what you said is exactly right. What a lot of people do is we'll blame other people because we think we're protecting ourselves. I'm gonna blame this person because I don't want it on me. But what you don't realize is in the long term, you do damage to yourself because that becomes your default and now nothing is your fault and everything is everybody else's fault. And then nothing's gonna work out for you. And you give your power away. When I blame other people, I do the exact same thing. And I came from an agency where they're like, I don't, they don't, they don't wanna hear excuses. Mm -hmm. Save your excuses. So I was also groomed like, own your shit. You make a mistake, own it. You make a mistake, fix it. Nobody wants to hear it. Find out what it is, fix what it is, and then that way you can move forward, forward and excel. You make yourself more insecure and you hit your own confidence when you do that, when you blame other people. Because you're saying, all these people have control over me. Mm -hmm. I have no control over my fate or what happens. I'm the captain of my ship. So I'm going to steer the direction it goes. And if a wave comes and it knocks me over, then I'm going to fix my ship and steer another way. I love that so much. And that so I've been, as you know, been suffering with health issues for five years. And for the first three years, I was going to all the doctors 
waiting for them to fix me. But over time, I figured out what was wrong with my gut and there was um, abuse on antibiotics. I was getting sick a lot. And so I was blaming the doctors. It's the doctors fault they were giving me too many antibiotics. I shouldn't have been having too many. They were just prescribing it. And I was then going to the doctors to fix me. Then the ownership thing came in. I was like, hang on a minute. If I say that it's on them that caused this, how can I then take ownership over fixing it? But if I flip my mind and say, Lisa, this was you. The doctors didn't force antibiotics down my throat. I swallowed them myself. The doctors would say, you know, I probably shouldn't give you this many antibiotics. Never once did I say, why? Never once did I sit there with Google and go, what is the worst thing that can happen if I take too many antibiotics? And once I realized that, I was like, wow, this is all my fault and that's amazing because now I can fix it. Now I'm not waiting for the doctors to fix me. And immediately I started going to biohacking. I got like glucose level monitors. And, and, and since then, over the last two years is when I've finally been able to make change. Do you realize that, this is, this is profound for me. Do you realize that you were taking these medications and not questioning anybody? Why? Authority. Yeah. A oh, doctor gave it to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he yes. must know. He must know. Well, if he's telling me to take it and we don't question, it's like, oh, okay, doctor, the doctor told me to do this. The doctor told me to do that. But you're choosing to put it into your body. Mm -hmm. Like we have no sense of like, like responsibility over ourselves. You are responsible. Like I am responsible for myself. So whatever happens to me happens to me because I choose certain things to some degree. Like I choose, like I have a choice and like I monitor that decision. And if, I choose wrong, I chose wrong. Mm. Rather than like this person, this. If I could say one of the things that, I don't want to say it's a pet peeve, but one of the things that disappoints me sometimes with folks is like when I hear excuses. And I'm like, why are you blaming everyone else for everything? Like life is being done to you. You're not, you're not doing to life. You're not experiencing life. You're not, you're not doing it. It's being done to you. Everything is being done to you. And it's so easy to get into that mindset. Mm -hmm. Right, because mo a lot of the time, excuses are valid, like they're valid, right? If you were to come to me and you were like, oh my God, I just got robbed. And you're like, this guy, he was like seven fur and I didn't see him coming. And so all of these things like, you know, and let's say they robbed you. But if you had said, I put my, oh God, this is a terrible situation. In fact, I don't want to be victim blaming and I worry that I'm about to go down a whole victim blame thing. There's actually something called victimology. Really? Yes. What's victimology? Uh, victimology is when we look at people who have been victims of crime to see if there's certain patterns and the, w there's, there's certain things that make somebody either more or less susceptible to crime and lifestyle is one of them. And so your lifestyle can impact you. It's not about blaming. Mm. It is lifestyle choices. How do you separate the two then? Well, it's about assessing. So it's like if I go out and I get drunk and I'm with a friend and my friend leaves me, I can either blame my friend for leaving me if something happens to me. I could be like, I went out, I chose to get drunk. Part of that's on me because I didn't have a proper plan in place mm. to make sure I had the right friend, to make sure maybe I didn't go out and get drunk. I, growing up, I avoided drinking. I grew up in New York. And there's a lot of bad things happening out, but I wanted to go out and be young and experience a nightlife. So I chose, I'm like, I'm gonna cho choose to have my wits about me, but I can still go out. Mm -hmm. And so I avoided drinking because I wanted to make sure nothing happened to me. That helped, helped me stay safe to some degree. Or, you know, working out at night. Like I, you, I've expressed this to you, I work out at night and I go running at night, but I will make an assessment. I'm like, oh man, it looks really desolate here tonight. I'm not gonna go. So victimology is about looking at patterns and then the findings and the research of victimology also show that if somebody's victim of one crime that they potentially are victimized multiple times. So usually you're not a victim once, but multiple times. And I think that's a really good thing to look at, not just when we're talking about crime or something being happened to you, but in life. So if you see that you're constantly being victimized by people, right? This person took advantage of me, then this person, this person did this to me. So if you're constantly in that victim space, ask yourself, what am I doing to let people think that they can do this to me? There's something I am doing or not doing that lets people think that they can treat me this way, that they can take advantage of me. And then being honest with yourself to change that. Just you entering the secret service, what you had to do with your mind 
has been incredible and that you said that you had to build mental armor in order to be part of it and that the secret service have to basically break you down in order to build you back up talk to me about that and what it takes to build mental armor well, usually when you go through these types of academies, one of the things they do is they break you down. They, they're not there to tell you, keep going, good job. Like You will not hear any of that stuff. They put you through a lot of stress. And part of the psychology uh, behind that is, it's actually called a hermetic effect, where you, give, you induce small amounts of stress into someone, and those small amounts of stress, when they happen, you learn to cope with them. And so you cope. Greater stress, you learn to cope. Greater stress, you learn to cope. And so what happens is you are a very different person from the day you show up, day one, to the day you leave because that they are helping build your resilience. Mm. And building mental resilience is having stress in your life, which is really goes against everything else that you hear. It's like, oh, live stress-free. You don't want stress in your life. Everything should be zen. It's the exact opposite because if you're not Think of it this way, if you're not dealing with any stress, if you're not dealing with adversity, you're not dealing with obstacles, then when something does happen, you're not gonna know what to do. Stress is good, certain levels of stress are good. They teach you how to, to cope, they teach you how to problem solve, they teach you how to fail, mm -hmm. and then to do better the next time. So training is like that, they break you down and they also wanna see who you are when you are stressed out. Because when you're stressed, you act, you don't really get to think, mm -hmm. And a big part of that is you want to see somebody's true nature, stress them out, and see who they are. You know, people, it's, it'll tell you a lot about somebody when they're not actually thinking about what do I do here? And can you think under stress? Not everybody can. Mm. So when you're under that amount of stress, what do you personally tell yourself to get through it? Because I've heard you say that um, it's not only such a male-dominated field, but it's like one of the hardest male-dominated fields. Um, so for you, like, how do you level up to perform at the level that they expect every, like, the men to perform? The truth is, Lisa, I don't know. Because I didn't go in there thinking, oh, I'm a woman. Oh, it's going to be harder for me. Oh, they're not going to want me. It didn't matter to me. Because if, you, if I went in with that mindset, I'm a woman, because right then and there, I'm, just, I'm defeating myself. Because I'm thinking, because I'm a woman, First of all, I'm making it a negative that I am a woman and it's a problem. Mm. And so now psychologically, I'm putting myself, before anybody even had a chance to put me at a disadvantage, I just put myself at a, at a disadvantage because I'm, and you know, fill in the blank. I am a, put your race, put your ethnicity, put your gender, put whatever you want. I am this, no one's gonna like me. But you show people who you are. Mm. If you sit there and you're verbally trying to convince everybody, hey, I should be here. Hey, you should respect me. Hey, you should this. You're going you're gonna to go bananas. And so you just perform. So in areas where I was weak, I performed. If, if I had to run, look, I was not a great runner. I never had to run before. And so I went into the academy and I was like, the running we did was, it was beyond running. It was just running with gear on. It was running with boots on. It was running just for miles and miles. It's running in the heat, in the freezing cold. I had to work on it. And so when we finished running during the day in training, guess what I did at night? I went running. And so there's, there's this level of psychology. It's like I didn't, I was, I was there. I had earned my place there and I was staying. I wasn't going anywhere. So beyond that, you have, we have so much power. We don't realize and we think that when we hear this noise or chatter around us, it's up to you how much you let it penetrate you. It's like you create, create this mental shield. So it's, who do you let in and what do you keep out? If after I did all these things, people still had an issue with me, despite outperforming even them, then at that point, you know, I'm not the problem. You're the problem. Mm. And so sometimes it's like, I'm actually not weak. You're the one who's weak, right? Weak people push other people down so that they can feel stronger. Hearing people's opinions is important because they can help guide you. But it's also important to know which opinions you should listen to and when you you know, which opinions you should not listen to. Mm. Can you differentiate the difference between those that matter and those that don't? How do you decide that? You know, in my case, when I went, my first week of training actually with the service academy, I remember some guys pulled me aside and they said, they, some people don't want you here. They don't think you should be here. And I remember being, thinking to myself, I just showed up. How do people not want me? And the reply was, well, they think that you're physically not capable to do this job. And at that point, I was like, all right, well, I'll show you. 
And so it wasn't about me getting into an argument and debating it. It was about doing it. And I think a, we, we do is we process things in our head. And sometimes thinking, 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 worrying, all that stuff, we create our own mental chatter and it distracts us from actually moving forward. Mm. And I focus on putting one foot in front of the other. If I sat there and I thought, oh my God, how am I going to get through the next six months? That would have been very difficult. But it's like, how am I going to get through the next five minutes? How am I going to get through the next class? How am I going to get through the next hour of shooting? How am I going to get through the next hour of combat training? And that's how I did it. That's how I approached it. But when you see that you're doing all these things and you're doing well, you also have to check in with yourself. Am I doing everything I can? Yes, I am. Am I succeeding? Yes, I am. So it's not me. It's you. Mm. But if I'm falling short, if I'm not going running at night, if I'm not training hard at night and I just show up there waiting for people to accept me, well, then now it's me. And so a lot of it is self-assessment. It's 50 percent you and then it's 50 percent the other person but you really have to be honest with yourself if you if you're blaming everybody outside of you for what's going wrong wrong for what's happening for why this why that this person doesn't like me this person doesn't respect me if you're so focused on that person you're not looking at you yeah. god i love everything you just said like i'm such a believer of like be so good they can't ignore you like concentrating on yourself, being so good at what you're doing that everyone around, around you literally cannot ignore you because you're that good. And so proving it, I absolutely love that, absolutely resonates with me. Um, and I love that what you said is like earning respect. You can't persuade someone to give you respect. You have to earn You it. can't make people respect you. Right. Respect is a gift. If somebody wants to give it to you, they will. And if they don't, they don't. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something freeing in that and knowing that I do everything I needed to do, I'm letting it go. If you want to respect me, you can. And if you don't want to give it, that's fine too. You can't force it. And, and in some sense, you don't need it. Oh. You don't need it. So when you walked into, let's say, interrogation rooms, um, is respect even on the table? Is that, a, is that a, something that is important in those moments? So it's interesting because before I became an interrogator, I didn't want to become one. It was a polygraph examiner. And my job was to step in and get confessions from people for cases where we had a difficulty. We didn't have enough proof or the person wasn't confessing and this, this person would get away with a crime. And initially, I didn't want to be an interrogator. I thought, who's going to talk to me? They're going to see me. They're going to high five themselves and be like, oh, this is going to be easy. And I'm happy in this situation that the senior examiner believed in me more than I believed in myself. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you will be good at this because no one's going to see you coming. <laughs> no one's going to see it coming. They're going to underestimate you. Right. And that's a positive thing. And, you know, and I was like, well, you know, how am I going to get people to respect me in the room? What if I have an issue? And one of the things he also told me is like, don't force it command respect. So we would do simple things like, hi, how are you? Evie, nice to meet you. Have a seat. I'd show you where to sit. Um, it was my room. I'd have a maneuver where, um, for example, like my chair had wheels on it. The person's chair whom I was inter interviewing didn't have wheels on it. The psychology behind that was, I can move around. Mm -hmm. This is my room. You're stuck in that chair. And so there, there are certain little things that I could do to show you I was in charge rather than tell you I was in charge. One of the things they warned me about, they said, don't tell people that you're the boss. I'm the boss. I'm the authority. You listen to me. The minute those words come out of your mouth, you just did the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. You just lost all credibility. When you have to tell somebody you're the boss, do you think they don't know you're the boss? If I said to the person, hey, I'm the special agent, do you think they didn't know <laughs> they were sitting across from a special <laughs> right. agent? And so it takes away from you. Mm. And so it's less this and more showing through action. How do you carry yourself? How do you walk into a room? How do you speak? How do you project your voice? All those things exude power and all those things command respect. Mm. Um, but I've actually got a quote of yours that is um, very powerful. I would like to read. My success is in standing my ground wasn't really about my physical strength. It was about my mental conviction. I had to speak with confidence to make sure those who heard my message heard it clearly the first time. And when I did act, I had to do it so in a way that assured it would not be mistaken for weak or uncertain of my abilities. Yeah. Ooh, how do you do that? <laughs> It's the way you carry yourself. 
I feel like break it what down. Does, what does size matter? Like that's the thing. Like power and strength. First, it lives in the mind. Right. So if I think myself strong, I am strong. If I think I'm like, you know, even with that, you know, Chinese delegate, or if, when I've had altercations with somebody bigger than me, or somebody's messed with me, you know, my, and, and I knew maybe they they could take me. You know, my mind, I'm like, all right, man. You know, you may walk over here, but and you may beat me, but I promise you, you're gonna be limping back. You're gonna have to earn that, and that's kind of like that that sentiment I've always had. Like I don't ever put myself underneath. It's like I'm gonna brawl if I need to brawl, but again, like I, I'm speaking this way, but it really isn't my go-to behavior. It was though. Like I really didn't want to fight everybody when I was younger, and I wanted to. To express my opinion and force my opinion down other people's throats, and I'm like, why am I doing that? And I realized that we do that one, ego. Your, your ego runs amok, and then two, insecurity. Mm. Especially when you're younger, you're trying to figure yourself out, so you don't know who the hell you are. And be, being grounded in, in yourself. So I, I really think it's like just about pausing and not letting yourself kind of like run wild. But once you do that, because you then say like, and when I did act, I had to do so in a way that assured、yeah. it would not be mistaken for weak or uncertain of my abilities. All right, so I'll give you an example: paralinguistics. And you know, I've talked about this. If I don't want somebody to go into this room, I'm going to say you can't go into this room. Versus, you can't go into this room. So my tone, my pitch, I speak with conviction. So what do you sound like when you deliver your information? What words do you use? That's the thing. What do they hear? What do they hear when they hear you? Like I know a lot of people who can't watch themselves on camera, can't hear themselves. Like, oh my God, is that what I sound like? Then fix it. How would you start to fix it then? Look, you want to strengthen your voice. You don't want to be like, okay, you can't go into this room. You can't go into this room. It's like you can't go into this room. You also have to believe in what you're saying and why you're saying. So when I did my previous job, like. I was protecting the president of the United States. I had the backing of the U.S. Secret Service, and look, having that gives you confidence.、Mm -hmm. Gives you confidence. But I also went through training academies, and I had people get in my face. I had to deal with things. But the more adversity you deal with, the, the more resilient you become. When you don't deal with adversity, when you avoid conflict, you don't know what to do when real conflict shows up. Repetition, repetition. In creating habits that are healthy, so that when things happen, you default to those habits, and you pull out that version of you. So I have that version of me that's the stand your ground version. It's like, oh no, no, no. But I'm also tactical about it. So if somebody can come at me or do something or betray me, I'm not going to come at them with the most obvious of ways. I'm also not going to do anything that brings me lower. You know, and it gets really hard, man, because that Greek part of me and that coins part of me wants to come out, but. I will. I won't call that person names. I really, really will control. But I'm like, I'll fix you in some other way,、mm. but the right way, the best way, the strategic way, not to hurt you, but to kind of get you out of their way. And you know what's interesting too? There's two main reasons, or well, there's two types of personas to be careful of: people who are extremely self-righteous, and people who use justification. And so, let me start with justification. When I did interviews, polygraphs. I would interview people who did really horrible things, and can I tell you, they would almost always justify it. We, I, we would have the saying: any person can do anything at any given moment in time, given the opportunity, because you can justify it to yourself. Well, I did, I punched him or I hit him with a bat because he shoved me. That's justification. Or I'm going to go after him and his money, you know, or after his family because he did this to me or she did that to me, and. Justification is very dangerous because you can you use that to justify you doing something bad, or somebody else will use that to justify harming you. At the end of the day, what you're doing is horrible. Just be aware of that you're just justifying it to yourself. Even when I interview people who committed crimes of passion or just crime in general, well, I did this to her because she did that, because she led me on, because she teased me, whatever, whatever the case may be, or because she. You know, betrayed me in this way, and so people hit back. So you ever have that time where you're like, I can't believe this person did this to me. It's like, yes, you can. You know why? Because in their mind, they justified what they're doing to you. That's why sometimes we have these moments. Like, what are they thinking? They're thinking I'm justified. The other persona to watch for is self-righteousness. 
That is huge. So that's the I am holier than thou. I know better. I'm I'm above you. Or when you have people, you ever, you know, you ever have anybody be like, you know what, I'm really going to pray for you because you need it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Anybody says that to you. It's like, first of all, it's the most condescending thing you can say to someone because it's insinuating I'm closer to God or Allah or whoever you believe to than you are. So I'm going to talk to him for you. Mm. No, don't worry about it. I'll go talk to him or her myself. And with self-righteousness, it's like you believe you're so right. And that's rigidity. That when you think, no, 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 I'm so right. Let me tell you how right I am. Red flags. And look at how people treat other people. Because if they gossip about other people, they treat other people the, poor, the, the wrong way, I promise you they're doing the same thing to you or will do the same thing to you. You have to look at people holistically, who they are with everybody, because that's going to come back to you. That's so amazing. I love those breakdowns. So if you've noticed these characteristics in people, is that when you're like, okay, this is someone that is probably going to cross a boundary, disrespect me, so I'm going to distance myself you from You feel them. dirty, yeah. right? Don't you feel that when you deal with certain people and they haven't betrayed you yet, but there's these little lies or little betrayals and you feel like, you feel dirty. I wouldn't have said dirty, but I totally get what you mean. But I, I have, that's one of my triggers is being spoken down to. So I definitely understand what you're what saying. What do you do? I'm, like, All right, I'm what, flipping the interview around oh, I know. Here. <laughs> I'm like curious investigator. because. What would I do? Okay, so if it was in business, I wouldn't bring it up because I wouldn't want to show that I'm weak because it is a weakness. I absolutely see it because it's a trigger. And I think any triggers can be a weakness. So for me, I would, it's my trigger and I've identified it as a trigger. I know that it means that that's a weakness. I wouldn't want to show it's a weakness. And to be honest, I think part of me is like, it's a weakness and I just need to get stronger. And I'm still, I tell myself I'm still in training. You're not there yet, Lisa. Like I don't beat myself up over it. But I do acknowledge it. I acknowledge what has happened. I acknowledge it's a trigger. I acknowledge it comes from my childhood. And I take deep breaths and I may either um, go quiet, actually, or I step back and will try and get out of that conversation immediately because I do not want them to see it. But I actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I think I do the opposite with my family. If it's my family, in the moment, I'm like, maybe you didn't realize, but you actually just disrespected me there. So I always then follow up with, Hey, I know you don't mean to, I know your intention, I know you love me, but I feel like you actually just disrespected me here. And then we'll just have that back and forth. And it's like, oh my God, no, I didn't mean to. This is why I did it. I was like, oh, cool, thank you for explaining. And if it's me, I'll, I'll even say, actually, yeah, you're right. Thank you for explaining. I realize this is my insecurity. I have to go and work on it. But if I still disagree, and I think that they actually did disrespect, I will keep going. And I'll start to break down what language, what word they used, um, because I really want to bond with them. And I think that when it's a stranger, if you put guard up, it's not a big deal. But when you want to get close to somebody, I'm always going to reveal the true, you know, the, the real me. Okay. So I feel like with family, I let a lot go with family. Interesting. Because like, it's just who they are. I guess like I've come to a place in age where I'm like, I know who I am, I'm grounded as a person, and I, I don't feel like I have to argue every point. Like sometimes like I'll have to check somebody here and there, I'll be like, hey, let's relax, <laughs> you know, and I'll, I'll do that. And, but even with my husband, I'll be like, hey, I'd appreciate you saying that. But I, I let a lot go because I found like it doesn't matter. Like my, I don't get as affected by it. Because, because you said something, you're like, most of the time they don't come from a place of, a bad place. Mm. So if I know they don't come from a bad place, why do I have to correct it? Like, th that's me. I'm just like, okay, that's mom. That's my brother. That's my husband. That's, but like, if I'm betrayed in some way, like I will, I will have it out. But usually for me, betrayal, like we're talking true, like you like stab me in the back, wherever you want to, I'm done with you. Because at that point, like you've done so much damage and I'm very mindful. Like I don't, I'm very mindful of my behavior because sometimes we can betray someone and justify why we're doing it, but I have to do this because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do by you in your little head, mm -hmm. but maybe not by everybody else or maybe not by me. And so if, if someone crosses that line, for me, it's, it's done. If somebody has it in them to harm you in such a significant way, why on earth would I ever want to repair that? I also can't bring you back in. It's just like, look, it's done. Just go. 
And then I think that's more powerful. And you don't even have to tell people. I've cut people out of my life silently. Why do I have to tell you? I just pull back, pull back, pull back. And then one day it's like, she's not around anymore. Yeah. How do you not let that feeling fester or build up then? Oh, sure, I let it fester and build up. But I do it in the privacy of my own home. And then you just let it go? Yeah, I'll go work out. I'll go run. I'll complain to my husband or bitch to my brother. Like, I'll do that. I let it, I let it come out of me. Mm. Like, you can't... This is the thing. You have to experience things. We don't want to suppress stuff because you suppress it, it's going to manifest itself in other ways. So you are allowed to do whatever it is you need to do to move through it. So I do that. Like I have moments where I'm like heated and angry. I'm not like kumbaya all the time. Like, you know, no, like I'll go through it. I may spend a week in rage, but then I know like don't have too much contact with people. Like if it's that deep of a thing, but I've, I've developed over time, again, resiliency and habit. It's just habit, repetition. You bounce back, you bounce back. You also like, and I say this in the book, don't be surprised. Everybody at the end of the day is looking out for their self-interests. They really are. Not because they're bad people, they just are. And if somehow you get in the way of that, you might get either pushed to the side or bulldozed completely. And so you have to understand that. So when you see from that perspective, you, you, it gives it a little bit of logic. I mean, you understand the pain of it, but you shouldn't be surprised. You shouldn't be like, I can't believe it. It's like, I get it. You can say that to a point, but then you know what? Let's move on because then you get into that victim mentality. Mm -hmm. And that's a really dangerous place to live. I know a lot of people who live there or I've experienced a lot of people who live there. I've kind of like tippy toed into that place myself, like in, when I was much younger. And I'm like, I'm not living in this space. I'm not going to be a victim. You know, I, I don't like that word. And so I just, for me, again, for me, the language I use in my mind is so powerful. Like I'm really thoughtful like I, of what I consume, what language I use to define myself. How do you do that? Because typically when people go to confront other people, it's like, all right, there's going to be a battle here. They're going to get their walls up. But I've heard you talk so eloquently about the words you, you use and how you are able to confront people without it being feeling like you're being combative. What are the tricks there? Because right. I love this. Well, don't, don't take it personal and don't talk to people like they're garbage. Don't sit there and yell at people. If you yell at people and talk to them like garbage, you're going to get garbage. Mm -hmm. And so if I want information, if I'm trying to get something from you or I want to be able to understand what you're thinking, I'm going to speak to you in a way that you understand. But I will approach you one at a time when I am not angry because there are moments where I'm like, I can't speak to this person. I will not speak to this person. I need to calm down. I need okay. to think clearly. And when I, get, when I get in the right mindset, then I'll figure out how to speak to you. So let's say you're dealing with somebody who's being dishonest okay. and they've been lying to you. Well, one thing to think about is when you approach them, you don't want to say, hey, I know you've been lying to me and this is how I know. Think of it this way. Who likes to be called a liar? No one. No one likes to be called a liar. So what you can say is like, hey, Lisa, look, I feel that there's some, you know, you're not being truthful with me about everything. There's some things that you're holding back and I really want this relationship to work. So I'm hoping we can have an honest conversation and open you know, dialogue and just really kind of get to the bottom of what's going on. It'd really, really be important to me. So I can be as pissed at you as much as I want, but I would do that. I actually did this with an ex-boyfriend um, and I suspected that he was being dishonest. He was either talking to his ex-girlfriend or whatever. This was many years ago. Do you think I was livid? I was furious, but I needed to know what was going on. Mm. I was like, I need to know. I can't spend time with this person. And so I put on my non-confrontational, I'm going to talk to you nicely hat. And I put on my interrogator interviewer hat. And I said, you know, and I just began talking to him nicely. You know, oh, tell me about your last relationship. Wow, it sounds like it was really important to you. What was it like? That must have been hard to break up. Do you really think I want to hear about her? No, <laughs> I did not. But I sat there and I remember yeah. being on the phone with him, listening to this conversation. And then eventually his walls go down. He forgets who he's talking to. He starts telling me more and more. And as he's talking to me, I realize, oh my God, he's still talking to her. Wow. Yes. And so at that, that point, I got what I wanted. I needed knowledge to figure out, do I stay or do I go? And so because I was able to get that information, I was able to go and leave that relationship and avoid future pain. So there's three things you should think about when you communicate with people. Body language, verbal language, paralinguistics. Body language is 
how you're seated. So right now, I like you, you like me, and one of the indicators is the way our legs are crossed. Yeah. They're actually co crossed toward each other. Mm -hmm. If we didn't like each other, we'd be maybe sitting something this like way. this, I'd be a little bit more that way, so I use mm -hmm. my body as a barrier. Or even leaning in, when you like somebody, you lean in. And so this creates like, hey, I like you, let's talk. So people are more engaged. Now verbal language is kind of what we touched on before, not calling somebody a liar, watching the things you say to them. Even when I would work cases where somebody would steal money, I would never say to them, did you steal that money? Mm -hmm. Did you take that money? If somebody rapes someone, I wouldn't say, did you rape her? Rape is an ugly word. Who wants to be a rapist? Did you hurt her? Right? So I would be mindful of the words that I used. And so that is the verbal language that we assess. Um, paralinguistics is how you say the things you mm -hmm. say. And so, again, based on your audience, if you have somebody who's a man who's really strong, who's a boss, you might want to... Depth, you know, deepen your voice, bring up a little bit more strength, and when you talk, project. If you're de dealing with like a young girl, you want to bring it down, soften it, match that person, mirror her language. And something as simple as, look at the words people use, like if do they like, oh, that's great, that's great, you know what I'm going to say? That's great, that's great. Mm -hmm. I even use it when I do emails. Uh, when I receive somebody's email and I, I look at how they introduce themselves. Hi, Evie, dear Evie, hello, Evie. Guess how I respond back? I look at their email. If they write hi, I write hi. If they write hello, I write hello. If they write dear, I write dear. And that's to meet them where they are? What is that purpose? To create something in common. I get mm. you, you get me. Subconsciously, it mm. makes them feel like, oh, I like her. She used dear, I used dear. They don't know that I'm doing that. Even right. when I close the email, sincerely, I'll put sincerely. People like people who they have things in common with. But don't pretend to be something you're not. So just bring the version of you that would resonate best with them. So you're saying, I'm not faking it, I'm just bringing out a part of me that works with that works person with better. So for example, usually when I did interviews in the past, I would bring a stronger version of me because typically I interviewed men who committed crimes. Mm. And so I had to be uh, fair and balanced, but I also had to exude a bit more strength and power, right? But I remember one occasion I interviewed a young woman. She was 22 years old. She was a babysitter, a nanny. And she had, there was a baby with a broken arm. And I had to interview her. Now, she had been interviewed about four times by state police. And they were like, she's not giving anything up. Do you want to give it a try? And I said, sure. So when I saw her and I walked into the interview room, this is my criminal now, right? Mm. She was scared. She was seated like this. Her voice was really, really soft and low. And I'm not going to come in there with the interrogator, Evie, because that would not have worked with her. Mm. But what worked with her is, hi, how are you? How's everything? I brought the version of me. It's still me right. that would work with her. Hour and a half later, confession. Wow. So it's really about paying attention to the person across from you. How do you do that? Shut up and listen to people. Talk less. I always say 80% listen, 20% talk. Mm -hmm. And especially when you first meet people and you're trying to figure them out, let them do the talking. Ask open-ended questions. And then that way, let people guide you and give you the information you need rather than guessing, what do mm -hmm. I say to this person? Who am I talking to? Let them tell you. And people love to talk about themselves. Let them knock on themselves out, you know. Let them tell you everything about themselves. And then... You figure out who they are, you figure out how they think, what's important to them, their values, their belief systems, what they want to share with you, and then you can chime in more intelligently rather than guessing or making assumptions and the wrong assumptions. So how do you do that then? So there's a woman that has, you guys think, has um, hurt this child. There's an assumption there that she has done it. She hasn't confessed. Mm -hmm. At what point do you say, oh, maybe she's not lying or... Maybe this is an assumption of ours and we are wrong. Like, how do you differentiate and how do you know when your assumptions are influencing you? Don't make assumptions. Don't assume your assumptions are facts. Mm -hmm. Is it conjecture or is it fact? And my husband always says that to me when we talk. He's like, is this an opinion? Is this what you think? Or is this what you know to be true? Mm -hmm. And so approach it from that regard. So in this situation, we had an assumption it was possibly her, but we weren't 100% sure. So when you speak to people, you have to be non-biased. Recognize, okay, I think it's this person, but I could be wrong. Mm. The way you should look at it is I'm going in there to find out the truth. Whether it was the nanny, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a business partner, whatever it is, 
I'm after the truth. How do I get to the truth? Mm. I, th I think this is it, but you also have to be aware that there's a slight possibility that I could be wrong. And so if you go in with this biased perception of like, I know this person did this. I know this person lied to me. I know this person deceived me. If you go in with that, no matter what they say to you, that narrative, whatever they say to you, you, you can make that narrative confirm with what you believe. It's confirmation yeah. bias. You can make it fit into what you want and then you'll disregard the things that don't suit you. So you say when you're going in, leave it at the door, don't go in with any type of bias, make no assumption, assume that there is that possibility. That what are you after? The yeah, truth. Yeah. You want to know something? I wanted to know that my, if my boyfriend was still talking to ex-girlfriend. Right. Every part of me wanted to be like, flip him the finger and tell him what I thought of him. But that, would that do me any good? Nope. No. And so I had an assumption. I wasn't sure. So I went in there, non-threatening, neutral conversation. Hey, I'm your BFF. Let's talk. Oh, my God, that's horrible. How did you break up? Oh, it's so, I can't. <laughs> I'm so sad for you. You really must miss her. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was really right. hard. But yeah. I had to sit through it because. You got what you wanted. Because I needed to protect myself mm -hmm. in some way. And so I need to know what he is doing, who he is talking to. Yeah. I'm sure people ask this a lot of you, but um, what are some key things on knowing when someone's lying to you or not? So it goes back to what we talked about, body language, verbal language, and paralinguistics. So what happens with body language if someone is lying? It's easy and it's not easy. So what I want to say with this, it's really studying human behavior and really assessing the person across from you. Now, if you know someone and you're able to develop a baseline, like you know this person, you know when they're talking to you, how they typically carry themselves and then you look for a deviation in their character so mm -hmm. if you ask somebody a really stressful question how are they going to respond i remember once i was interviewing a woman it was for a job um because we had to you had to take a polygraph to get into the service and during the interview i had to ask her about her drug history and the whole interview for example she's sitting like this she's nodding her head we're connecting it's great and the minute I start asking her about her drug experimentation, her legs started doing this. Just this. Nothing else. Just up and down, up and down. So I'm watching this and I'm thinking, could be a fluke, could be something. So we talk for a little bit, we change the conversation. When I change the conversation away from drugs, her legs stopped. Then I'm thinking, okay, I need to go back to this to see if there's an issue here. So I brought the conversation back. I'm like, hey, I have another question about what we talked about earlier about your drug experimentation. And the legs started oh doing God. this. And so in that moment, I knew, I'm like, okay, something's bothering her with this question. Now, I didn't want to make the assumption she's a liar. Right. Could be maybe her husband does drugs, her father does drugs, or who knows? Or maybe it is her. And so at that point, I become curious. And when you become curious, when you learn to read people's nuances, you become curious, and then you ask the follow-up questions. Then you start, oh, I need to pay attention, red flag. And so that's where body language comes in. Mm -hmm. What are they doing that's different from what they've done before? Because when we're stressed out, our body bleeds information. So you can sit there and be really calm and collected and lie to somebody. But sometimes the body can't control it. It's too much. There's too much happening. And, you know, there's this also this, this, con this concept about eye contact. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, right. you know, look me in the eyes and tell, you, tell me the truth, right? I can look you in the eyes all day long and lie, lie, <laughs> lie. So it's really just understanding that person. But if you notice mm. that I'm always looking at you in the eyes and then the minute I start to tell you something that you're concerned about, I look away. Mm. Now you're like, why did she just look away? This whole time she's looking at me in the eyes. I ask her this difficult question. Now she shifts her gaze. Mm. So you're looking, for, you're looking at the difference. What changed in me? And now with, with language, there's also things to look at in language. Just a lot of times it has to do with paying attention. So if I say to you, Lisa, you know, what time did you get home last night? And you say to me, well, you know, I usually get home around six. Did you answer mm. the question? But well, you'd be surprised how many people will let that go and they will move on. I didn't ask you what time you usually get home. I asked you what time did you get home last night. Because so people are trying to avoid lying directly. Is that why they do it? And yes. they hope that it slips through the cracks. It does. Well, look, people, we all know it's wrong to lie. So we don't like lying. So the, the most popular way we lie mm -hmm. is through omission. We will leave something out. We will be vague in our language. And so we really want to listen to the language. Are people answering your question? Um, when you ask a question, do they respond back with a question? Who, me? 
Are you talking to me? Mm. It could be a stalling tactic. Yes, it's me. There's nobody else in the room. It's just you and I. Who else would be <laughs> asking you? And so listening to the language that people use. Also, another indicator is usually um, when we speak, we'll say I. I feel this way. I this. I went here. I that. I, I, I. What you'll tend to see in verbal language is somebody who doesn't use I, uh, it me means that there's a lack of commitment, that they're telling you something, but they're not committed to it. Mm. So think of the sentence. If I say to you, uh, miss you, love you, can't wait to see you. Okay. I miss you. I love you. I can't wait to see you. There's more of a commitment on that latter one. So mm -hmm. you can possibly assume, again, assumption, that the first person really doesn't miss you all that much, really doesn't love you all that much, doesn't care whether they see you. And so uh, there's so many clues in the things we say. Then also how we say them. You know, do people speak with conviction? Are they vague? So when it comes to deception, people who lie are typically vague because when you're lying, there's so much more you have to remember. They won't be as detailed. Mm. Wow. Yes, that I wrote was, a whole that book. That was fire, girl. <laughs> and everything is in the book that they can find. Everything is just There's so down. much stuff, but it's all great stuff. And it's all, it's all the little things. Like, there's no gimmick. There's no, right. like, here, just do these three steps right. and you will know. Yeah. It's, it's really understanding people, studying human behavior. Look, I'm fascinated by people. And everyone's unique and everybody's different. And so you want to learn people, understand people. And the more curious you are about people, the more you'll be able to read them and think what, what matters is to this person. Why would they lie to me? Mm. What, 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 would there be their, what would be their incentive, their motive? And that's where empathy comes in. Using empathy to understand somebody else's perspective. See the world not through your eyes, through their eyes. Mm. I think if you really want to be accurate at reading people, you're looking for what are the hidden emotions that someone doesn't feel safe sharing. Mm. And one, can you address them? But two, can you make them feel more safe? Research finds it's about 60 to 90% of our communication is nonverbal. It's a lot. Insane. It's insane.